Thanks for uh, hanging around. Um, we're moving into the, the second phase this afternoon. Um, I'm not going to introduce uh, the expert panel individually because hopefully you have their details up there um, and that saves me having to repeat it. Um, what we're doing is um, rather than having a format where people give individual talks, we're going to do it a little bit more uh, as me feeding them questions to introduce what they're going to say. Um, we'll do that with each of the panel individually, just picking up on um, their respective interests uh, and, and their participation in Paris, um, and then throw it open um, for uh, more of an open discussion Q&A um, and um, uh, see where that takes us all, uh, and, and very much picking up um, the, the flavour of Paris being touched on already. Um, and uh, helpfully, uh, the details come in the order I'm going to take them, which makes it easier for you and for me, because I haven't memorised any of the names yet. So I'm um, starting with uh, Christina, um, who you, you'll see from the slide, a uh, legal advisor to uh, the Norwegian team, as it were, if I can put it uh, just quite so bluntly. Um, and if you could maybe just take us through, give us a bit of a flavour, um, the last few days of the negotiations in Paris, um, and uh, you know the most um, uh, difficult parts, the red lines for compromise was difficult, just giving us that flavour as the person who was there. Um, Francesco said you know, he was the observer, he wasn't quite in um, uh, the action, as it were, you were, so share. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to Francesco, first and foremost, to, to, for organizing this event. It's, it's great, and it's actually, for, for what I know, the first event like this after Paris, and it's, it's wonderful uh, to, to have the opportunity to reflect a little bit about what, what happened in Paris and, and what, what are the next steps to, to expect. Well, talking about the last days in Paris, I mean, we all were there, so you probably get five different accounts of what happened <laughs> in the last days of Paris, and it's maybe perhaps due to sleep deprivation and the general level of exhaustion that people remember things differently. But if we, if we, uh, if we start at the very tail end of things, uh, which I thought was very striking, because if you've been involved in international negotiations, you know that Perhaps something is successful if everybody is a little bit unhappy. You know, then 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 that's that's where the middle ground is. Everybody is giving a bit and like a bit a little bit grumpy, like okay. But Paris was different, absolutely, completely, strikingly different because everybody was happy. And you wonder how how did that happen? I mean, how did that come about? And I think um, there are many reasons. And Francesco and and Haro alluded to some of them. On the way between Copenhagen to to Paris, a lot of of things changed in terms of political will and, and technological advances and, and finance available. A lot of different periods, but in Paris, I think one of the main or the defining um, issues was the, the presidency uh, and the way, especially throughout the last couple of days, they conducted the consultations that were constantly ongoing, but nobody knew who was being consulted on what, on when, and what did they actually say. It was all kept within the presidency. And uh, for the last three days, um, the, the presidency issued draft papers, draft decision texts um, for the final agreement. And the interesting thing was that they tilted slightly into one direction and then the other way and then you could feel that the final the final paper would be somewhere in the middle and it was very exciting to see how, how these the dynamics played out but uh, to, to your question about what the most difficult issues I think there were two two overarching themes that defined at least the second week in the last days and they were uh, defined as ambition and differentiation they were also being facilitated and conducted slightly in separation in different rooms but the challenging thing was that they were really interconnected and you couldn't really resolve one without listening to the other or, or understanding the other but differentiation and ambition I think until the very end remained uh, the two, two most uh, difficult and overarching and intricate um, 
issues. And the way it was in fine landed, I mean, we, we already discussed, or uh, uh, Francesca discussed some of these things, was that um, we had we had the, the possibility, or everyone had the possibility to give uh, to give input to the presidency, but they in in the end made a judgment call and reflected the <coughs> the, uh, the the landing zone in the the text that were then being presented to everyone. It was nothing that was really negotiated word by word by parties, but it was something that was uh, introduced by by a third and objective um, uh, chair. I don't know if, if you want me to go into more detail on these issues, <laughs> or if you want to leave it uh, well, later. Well, maybe leave that, and people can ask in the question period if there's anything specific sure. you want to pick up on. Um, <clears throat> and maybe moving then from um, the general to pick up on uh, the, the involvement of the different interest groups, the different countries. Harold touched on that a bit, naming some individual companies and uh, countries. Sorry, Freudian slip. Countries on the way through. Um, Achala, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see from there. Uh, you're the legal and technical advisor to the chair of the LDC group. We went into acronyms, so that's the least developed countries group. Um, could you maybe um, give us a little bit of a report back? How was it for the LDC group? Thank you very much, and also uh, thank you, Francisco, for organising this and also waking me up. I was asleep until last Monday after Paris. I categorically <laughs> refused to wake up and read anything because it was so tiring in the Paris, particularly the last few days of negotiations that went up to uh, starting from the morning and all all day and then all night and then we and the. Paris accommodation were too far from the Bruges, so um, yeah, so we had some hard time. I work with the uh, 48 uh, poorest countries in the world, least developed countries. Their per capita, the GDI per capita is um, less than $900, um, and um, their emissions are uh, less than 5% um, of global emissions, and they are like more than 1 billion people. So. Um, I work with these 48 countries who come, money negotiators come um, on the day of uh, the flight they have to um, prepare or you know just get their documents and go. They really don't have time to prepare. One person in the Department of Environment or Ministry of Environment is responsible for climate change negotiations, for biodiversity convention, for desertification convention, for many other multilateral um, agreements. So these are the people that I work with. And we don't have many lawyers who are dedicated to per issue. And then we come to negotiations, UN negotiations, where negotiations are so complicated with so many agenda items, so many parallel meetings going in, in and then issues appear and disappear even before you realize. Um, and then, you know, um, I ask the legal advisor to the chair of the least developed countries, um, I am called to help the negotiations on capacity building. And then there is another room going on on compliance. And then there is another meeting, um, parallel meeting going on on uh, entry into force or ambition or differentiation. So it was pretty hard. Not only Paris, the whole process, um, all the negotiations are hard for LDCs. We have two delegates, two members per country funded by the UNFCCC and that's the number that we have to focus on. We get many other people funded by NGOs, etc. but those two people pr per country is the is the number that we have to uh, focus in. And then we have around 90 or 100 people, but they are all, all of them are not experts. <coughs> um, some are very junior people um, and um, don't know what's going on. So that's the background. Um, and then, um, then the, the, the issues, um, as I mentioned, compliance, Christina, myself, and Jay, we were all in that room. There were so many versions of the compliance mechanism that appeared. Compliance committee, somebody proposed. A compliance mechanism with two branches, one for enforcement, one for facilitation. That was also another version. And then um, implementation committee, no compliance. And then multilateral consultative process. So we just have to go back to our room and just re do research. What does that mean? Does that mean multilateral consultative process? Does that mean compliance? Do I, will I know what 
will happen if I don't achieve my target one day? No. So um, that's the that's the background we were in. Um, being LDCs, our main focus obviously was to have the have the recognition within the agreement on the specific needs and special situations of LDCs, the lack of capacity, resource constraints, etc. Um, and then adaptation and finance for adaptation. And uh, mainly also we pushed very hard on loss and damage, the four main um, areas. But we, we were more strategic than that. We wanted to go beyond being vulnerable. We wanted to be the moral voice of negotiations. Therefore, we also wanted to focus on the legal rigor of the agreement. We wanted to have the highest possible legal rigor at international level. So we were calling for a protocol with legally binding commitments, obviously, and also compliance mechanism. Um, we were also calling for highest possible participation. So those three elements that Harrow mentioned, the legal rigor, the highest possible participation, as well as the effectiveness of the agreement. In terms of highest possible participation, we were um, the, the bad children of the G77 plus China family because we were calling for all the countries to commit to a, a, an agreement, and uh, that that goes beyond the developed developing country uh, differentiation. We wanted, including LDC, we wanted everybody to commit to taking mitigation um, targets. And and then, um, what did we achieve? What, what are we happy? I am a fifty percent glass full person, um, including the whole of the group that I represent. Actually, we go more than 50%. We are actually happy of what we achieved. Because just the two days before the, uh, the conference ended, as Christina said, we didn't expect this document to come out. We didn't think that loss and damage will be there because the US was, no, 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 you are not going to get that. We didn't think 1.5 degree target was going to be there because there were so many, including developed, developing countries, um, um, disagreeing with that. Um, so we are happy with the legal form of the agreement, um, all the entry into force provisions, etc. There are commitments, particularly that commitment that Francesco presented, uh, preparing, maintaining, and communicating an INDC, but we are unhappy that there is no commitment to achieve a target or implement the target. Um, we are happy with the compliance mechanism, um, in terms of effectiveness of the agreement, also there is this ambition mechanism. We call it this, uh, the mechanism for increasing ambition over time. We call it spiral of ambition. So every five years, countries come together, look back, and also look forward in terms of what they are going to do with that principle of progression and no backsliding. Um, but it's... it's uh, they will list in the detail. If you read it very carefully, there are a lot of vague provisions. Um, as a lawyer, I myself now say, huh, how did we end up with this? Um, you know, there are a lot of provisions that are unclear. But going forward, there are a lot of work to be done between 2016 and 2020. A lot of rules and procedures, methodologies need to be agreed. Um, and also um, uh, implementation of INDs, NDCs from 2020. And I must also say, 46 out of 48 countries, LDCs, um, have submitted their, uh, they had submitted their INDCs before Paris. We, many INDCs, even being LDCs, uh, have uh, non-conditional, uh, unconditional targets in those INDCs. There are parts conditional uh, uh, on climate finance or other support, but many have quantifiable, unconditional targets in their INDC. So with that positive note, I will stop. Thank you very much. Can I just ask, INDC? NDC. NDC. Yes. Right. Nationally Determined Contributions. Acronyms. Thank you. Um, turning then to um, Felipe um, from Brazil. Um, and looking at it from uh, the Brazilian perspective, um, maybe just touching on um, the role uh, that you and Brazil took in uh, the Paris negotiations, um, where you stand, or, or, or um, 
uh, depart from other countries in the process and, and how that all actually panned out. And again, likewise, um, are you happy? We know everyone's tired. I think we can take it as a given. I got that message firmly. It was very hard work. <laughs> so, um, I, I, how was it for Brazil? Well, thank you. And as others, thank you, Francesco, and thank you, the University, for this opportunity. Um, it was good. <laughs> and, and, and to me personally, uh, the second week uh, was kind of pulled out of the delegation to assist my minister who was doing facilitation. So I was removed from the eye of the storm, so to speak, and uh, was, I actually got to sleep in the second week, unlike, <laughs> unlike some colleagues. Be jealous. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we, we saw that in a very positive uh, uh, note, and, and to us, how, how we position ourselves in the in the agreement, I hope, I hope my negotiation colleagues won't disagree with me in public, but we like to see ourselves as bridge builders uh, in, in the process. Uh, and this is sort of a political capital we have been building throughout the whole UNFCCC uh, process, but also specific in the Durban platform, the negotiations towards uh, Paris. Uh, it's not a one off thing, it's not something that's strict to the top. I think uh, it's very important to look at all the negotiation sessions, and, and, and to us, it was very rewarding to see a lot of our proposals, things that we had put forward uh, more than a year prior to Paris, galvanize and, and, and take form into, in, in, into text. And that's um, I attribute that a little bit to uh, faith that the Brazilian government really has in the multilateral system as the, the proper way for the international community to come up with uh, global, uh, global responses for global challenges. And there is no challenge more global than, than climate change. Picking up on some of the topics that were presented in the previous panel, um, the multilateral aspect of, uh, of the negotiations as bringing, bringing the global response uh, under a multilateral <coughs> umbrella uh, is very important to the very nature of the climate change pro uh, problem. Uh, I, I have serious doubts that we would ever be able to have an effective response uh, if we continue with a fragmented uh, sort of international regime. Uh, I'm not sure the Paris Agreement <coughs> will be able to deliver the environmental effectiveness that uh, understandably is expected of it. I, I, I am certain it's not a silver bullet. I don't believe in silver bullets. Uh, but I, I am certain that a uh, response outside the multilateral framework would not, would not be, be uh, an effective one. Um, in our role in, in, in that larger setting, uh, I think there is a structural aspect of it, uh, which is Brazilians define themselves through diversity. And it's very important to our culture, diversity as an asset. Uh, and that plays well in the negotiations because at in some level, we are able to relate basically with everyone and, and not every country is able to say that. So we are one of the largest econ economies in the world, but we are also have huge development challenges. Uh, we have uh, very, one of the cleanest energy matrices in the world, but we're also oil producers. Um, we have, most of our populations live in cities, we have industrial economy, but at the same time, uh, export-oriented rural uh, economy. Uh, it's, we are a forest country, but we also have one of the largest populated desert areas in the world. So that allows us to have uh, dialogue and empathy 
with uh, a broad range of actors that, quite frankly, I, I think not every, if any, other party uh, has this uh, this capacity of uh, capability of, of empathy for for some of the substantial issues, and this this in Paris in, in particular has been reflected uh, in what was hailed as a, as a game changer uh, that uh, Brazil joined the, the, the when Brazil joined the High Ambition Coalition, and it was actually funny because. People were appalling that as if it was unexpected from us, and we were like, "Of course, where else would we be here?" So it's a very, to sum up, it's a very rewarding. Uh, and we we really see uh, some of our proposals, some of the, the, our ideas in that text, and then we are uh, we are very optimistic about uh, the agreement. Uh, in terms of effectiveness, uh, I think there are two ways to measure effectiveness. So there's not only the environmental uh, effectiveness aspect, although that's that's really important. But when you're talking about an international agreement, an international regime, another way to see it is whether it changes behavior. And uh, the nature of the agreement is one that uh, we believe will allow us to change behavior in a more Progressive, and dynamic way into into the future. Thank you. Um, and then moving on to uh, Mathieu, um, we can see special advisor of Morocco for COP twenty one. Um, so focusing on the Moroccan experience um, and um, just in, in, in the, the 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 preparation, um, there was a suggestion about. Um, uh, maybe talking a little about about learning from the French experience of, of leading up, um, and also um, uh, what Morocco uh, might do in preparing for the, the future, as it were, and, and further summits, um, and indeed uh, the fact that several people in the room, from what I picked up, will be meeting up in Morocco towards the end of the year. I'm jealous. Apart from the fact that I'm sure there will be a similar lack of sleep, so maybe I'm not that jealous. Um, so if you could maybe um, touch on, on those sorts of aspects and, and how Paris was for you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks to Francesca and also the University for giving me this opportunity to participate in this um, prestigious panel. Um, perhaps I should clarify a bit uh, what was my role in the run up to COP21. I'm, I'm just a legal practitioner, I'm just a barrister admitted at the Paris. Brussels Bar Association, specializing in environment and climate, but I've, I was involved, I've been involved in this kind of talks since uh, 1998, such so a big, long time. Uh, and perhaps this is the reason why Morocco, already um, in 2010, asked me to provide some support to understand better the negotiation process. So it was very much uh, doing some capacity building activities in Morocco, and I did that every year. Uh, twice or three times uh, per year, uh, but before the COP and at the COP, I was not a member of the Moroccan delegation. But um, as you know, Morocco has um, proposed to uh, assume the uh, uh, presidency of the, the future uh, COP22, uh, which will start on, on day one of COP22. Of COP uh, it's clear that uh, the status of Morocco in in, in this forum has, has a little bit changed. Although Morocco has already assumed such a responsibility in 2001 uh, at COP7, and it, which was quite a successful COP because uh, uh, it allowed the uh, adoption of what we have among ourselves called the uh, Mar Marrakesh Accords, which was uh, an important step forward uh, towards the, uh, not the just implementation, but also the entering into force of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, in, later on in 2005. So there is some kind of experience, but I've got to say that uh, for that particular COP, COP21, uh, uh, Morocco was in a quite particular situation and position uh, for, for many reasons. First of all, because uh, <laughs> for the very first time, the delegation was uh, made up of more than 200 people, uh, among which 196 were uh, cousins or friends of the of the king, um, <laughs> <laughs> and because they, it was very interesting in in, in the uh, 
in the Bourget, you had two important places. One for, it was the quite fancy and, and very flashy uh, pavilion of, of uh, the delegation of Morocco. And next to it, uh, uh, just at the entrance of the plenary uh, rooms, you had a very big and beautiful uh, stand uh, for the future COP22. Uh, so with a big screen showing all the good things that Morocco has been doing on, on climate change. Actually, it's, it's also an interesting country for that particular reason, because Morocco is a very low emitting, uh, is still a very low emitting uh, country, but also very vulnerable. Uh, it's uh, it's a very much uh, 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 suffering from, from water scarcity and, and desertification, uh, which has um, a great, a great impacts on, on the agriculture. And also, I mean, there are still some social inequality in Morocco that uh, uh, has uh, it's led to the adoption of important uh, policy measures, particularly for the deployment of renewable energy in rural areas uh, to uh, um, offer um, access to sustainable energy to the rural uh, communities, so to speak, and the poorest people. But still, Morocco had to show some visibility there and also to prepare uh, for uh, COP22. And also Morocco has a very particular position as a, an Arab group in Africa and also member to the G77. Uh, that makes the positioning of Morocco in a, in a quite difficult situation uh, because uh, you have always a number of tensions among these groups on a number of issues. Uh, and I, I just take an example, a very simple example. I mean, I don't know how much time we have spent uh, on this issue of whether or not to address people under occupation in the preamble part of uh, the uh, draft agreement and in some operative uh, uh, provisions like in Article 4, for instance, at that time it was Article 4 adaptation. Uh, actually, these people under occupation, uh, that was a proposal, this uh, wording, um, that from Saudi Arabia. Uh, very much for tactical reasons in response to uh, uh, human rights that was proposed by uh, other uh, parties. And the big question for Morocco was, can we support Saudi Arabia, which are friends in the uh, Arab group? Uh, but at the same time, uh, Morocco has been constantly uh, looking for uh, some compromise in particular on, on this kind of touchy issues. And so, I think they hopefully contributed uh, to finding uh, the, uh, the good compromise that we have had in the end to, to address uh, this, uh, these issues uh, in the preliminary part, part, part oh, sorry, of, the, of the agreement. Um, but overall, Morocco decided uh, to adopt a very um, neutral position in, in, in this COP, uh, to not push for uh, too much for some issues. However, Morocco was very, uh, uh, drew particular attention on, on some of the uh, issues, particularly uh, the legal force of INDC or NDC, so, so the housing of uh, the INDC uh, in or outside the agreement in the registry or in an annex to the agreement was, was a particular uh, issue for for Morocco, uh, having in mind that Morocco was and wanted to be uh, one of the first African countries to submit an NDC, and actually they did very well in preparing the NDC in less than three months, I think, uh, and submitted it in, in early uh, June uh, last year. And also because Morocco wants to show some leadership at the regional level, at least among the Maghreb countries. Uh, that it uh, takes really seriously climate change uh, in, into consideration. So I guess uh, at the, at, in Paris, Morocco uh, was quite pleased with the uh, end result. I'm not saying what I do think. Uh, <laughs> I do uh, believe that Morocco, and uh, that was, I invite you to listen to, uh, to the, the statement made by uh, Minister Akimaiti in the plenary session, uh, the closing the plenary <coughs> session, where she really points out the transformational um, uh, impact uh, that we can expect from, from the Paris Agreement. 
although she also pointed out uh, the fact that in terms of ambition, I mean, it will rest very much upon uh, countries uh, to assume a responsibility uh, to do something, to engage in climate action. Uh, and, and certainly that the, the Paris Agreement was a, a bit weak on, on that particular point uh, in terms of uh, aspirational terms, let's say. Uh, just uh, in the run-up to COP22, uh, I think Morocco has to prepare itself. Uh, we, in the end, we had a, a, a quite a small delegation, as I said, four or five people who were fully involved in, in the negotiations. Uh, and that, that uh, was uh, too little capacity to really engage on all the issues, as uh, uh, like the NDLDCs, which I just mentioned. But I think we, we face exactly the same uh, situation. Difficulties to cover all the issues at the same time with highly complex issues uh, to be dealt with at the, at the same time. Uh, however, I, my sense is that there is the, the capacity particularly in the young generation um, in Morocco. Um, I hope the delegation will structure um, a good team um, that would bring together the experts from both the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Environment Ministry as soon as possible. Actually, this is being discussed at the moment in, in Rabat. Uh, and I do believe also that the French presidency, which will <coughs> continue its efforts um, until uh, COP22 starts, uh, will provide an effective support to the Moroccans, uh, particularly to engage in the preparation of, of COP22. There will be informals uh, already at least a level, hopefully right after the um, signature ceremony, uh, uh, hopefully, in, or I believe, in, in Rabat in, in, in May. Um, it is also anticipated, anticipated that uh, uh, Morocco will, uh, let's say, uh, uh, place innovation uh, on the top of its agenda, among the priorities uh, it wants to, uh, to, to push uh, in, in, Rab in Marrakech. Sorry. Uh, however, I think uh, Morocco is uh, perfectly aware that this would be a very difficult COP. Uh, <coughs> it has to be well prepared to avoid that we reopen some uh, Difficult issues, and uh, I guess there are some a number of uh, provisions which may uh, be subject to some interpretation by some parties. And uh, Morocco will have to do its best, together with with France, um, to resist to these uh, attempts. It's very important. Uh, I don't think more Marrakesh can be the first CMA, the first uh, conference of the parties. Although there is. No date in the Paris Agreement, no 2020 date is not there. But let's imagine we have uh, Obama signing the agreement in, in April, and perhaps two others just later, put the agreement enter into force, and, and Marrakesh become the first um, CMA. I, it's just a joke. Uh, <laughs> I tell you, the Americans just <laughs> pray that this will not happen. <laughs> I believe they, they already find the, the work they have um, in front of us um, enormous and, and very, very challenging. Uh, <coughs> but uh, I, I do believe they, they have the capacity and I hope they will organize themselves as soon as possible to do that um, very well. Thank you very much. Um, finally, uh, looking at the situation in Scotland, um, I don't think we're going to have any more poetry. I was very impressed with poetry. Um, but uh, uh, you, you can always tell there's so much pride in Scotland, and of course it's very appropriate that we look at it from the, the, the Scottish perspective. Um, a particular warm welcome to Gavin, because um, he's a substitute as of, I think, yesterday. Um, uh, John uh, Ireland, who was going to be speaking, um, was pulled away on other urgent business. So um, uh, we've uh, I, we've probably all been there, but thank you. Last minute is never particularly easy. Um, and if you could maybe just um, touch on uh, the situation in Scotland with climate change. Um, I was having a chat with you earlier. I think it might be useful for some people in the audience if you could explain um, where Scotland sits legally within the UK and how that impacts on the situation with 
Scotland being part of the climate change negotiations. Um, and uh, I think that goes back again to, I think it was Harrow mentioned about national and subnational. Um, and uh, the situation of Scotland's a particularly interesting perspective on that. Um, so, uh, Gavin, if you could maybe share some thoughts. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Neil. Yeah, it's just uh, important to uh, say uh, at the beginning that uh, climate change is a devolved matter for the Scottish Parliament, uh, whereas an international treaty negotiation um, is reserved to Westminster and the UK government. So we, uh, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish government run the climate change programme in Scotland, but when we go to the Paris COP, for example, we go there as part of the UK negotiating team. Um, but uh, we were very fortunate this year when we were, we've been to uh, the COPs since Copenhagen with, uh, with uh, Scottish ministers every year. Uh, we were very lucky to have the First Minister with us in, in Paris this year. Very important in terms of getting her to see it firsthand the uh, negotiations, how important they all were. Um, we were very fortunate to have a really strong story to tell to the international community um, at Paris. We go as part of the UK team. We don't take part in actual negotiations. We support the UK team as the other devolved administrations do by general promotion of high ambition on climate change and in our case, <coughs> promoting climate justice as well. Um, so you know, Scotland had a very strong story. We set legislation um, in 2009, and the purpose of that legislation was to provide certainty about Scotland's low carbon <laughs> future. And that's what we wanted the Paris Climate Treaty to do for the global economy. And we think it has delivered on that. It's, it's given a signal, clear signal about the direction of travel. Um, in Scotland, because we've had this strong political leadership, uh, we've had very strong targets. Uh, we, have, we were able to report in Paris that we've cut our emissions by 38% uh, since 1990, and that was compared to the 31% that was originally planned. Um, we've almost tripled our renewable electricity capacity and now generate almost half of our electricity demand from renewables. And important in the Paris context, uh, we had messages about being able to deliver early and we delivered uh, five years early on our community renewables target, 500 megawatts of community renewables, and we delivered seven years early on our energy consumption target. And we thought, knowing that Paris was probably going to deliver uh, a solution that might equate to three degrees uh, rather than the two or one and a half degrees, it was important to be able to provide messages to the international community, examples from Scotland, about how that agenda could move once the, you know, Paris was over and settled that agenda could move further and faster, and we've got very strong examples of that uh, uh, from, from Scotland. Uh, to link with the, the strong theme that's been running since Lima about uh, subnational governments, a term that we don't particularly like, uh, but uh, devolved administrations, subnational governments, regions, cities, um, businesses, uh, we had uh, developed a strong set of stories about you know, developments in Glasgow, particularly strong set of stories there. Um, and, you know, so we, we had a really good package to be able to tell the international community. And I say, generally, we're always warned by the Foreign Office not to jump to conclusions about what kind of deal it was. And we're kind of still considering, you know, the implications for us. And uh, the responses we've seen from other countries have been uh, very favorable. But like ourselves, wondering about the implementation and how we're going to deliver our part. And that's very much, uh, you know, uh, an issue for us going forward, how we build on this space that Scotland has, has, has built. Um, and uh, it was very important for us to be able to promote climate justice. And we noticed uh, a big step forward when President Along used the, the term when he was opening the call. And we thought, you know, we've been talking about climate justice for you know, five or six years now. And uh, it, was, it was really uh, important to us uh, to be able to announce um, uh, a further doubling in funding from Scotland for some of the world's poorest communities in climate justice. And we think the climate justice moral component very important for focusing political minds uh, when it comes to decision making. So that's the, the story from Scotland. And of course, we, the question is now where, where we go from here.
I, I mentioned climate justice, so I should probably explain a little bit more about Scottish Government's policy, because it is a controversial term and one that hadn't really seen the light uh, of day before in the UN negotiations. It's one that makes uh, developed countries very uncomfortable because of its links to loss and damage and issues about compensation. But there are different interpretations about climate justice. Uh, we were attracted to the concept because it's, it's a moral argument. Uh, but the challenge for us, we had a, a, an international climate justice conference in 2013, and we identified the challenge there was to, uh, was to develop a, a definition of climate justice that governments and businesses could use. It's, it's, it's quite often seen as having an activist or legal, uh, legal sort of roots. So, uh, and our concept of climate justice is really about building on human rights uh, approaches, which many governments and businesses are, are now incorporating into the way they operate. Um, and it's a forward-looking shared agenda uh, rather than an agenda looking back at you know, past wrongs and compensation issues. Uh, and it's basically designed to, to prevent, to get uh, developed countries focused on action to prevent the worst impacts of climate change falling on the, on the global poor and vulnerable, which, which could be here or, uh, or abroad. Um, and uh, uh, Chala, you maybe want to say something on behalf of the, the LDCs. Yeah, thanks. Um, it was um, LDCs together with um, EOSIS, um, the European Union, um, African group as well, number of uh, more than 100 countries together were calling for a protocol. Um, and that's, that was linked to the legal rigor of the, uh, the outcome, the form of the, um, the outcome in Paris. Uh, but we knew that name actually doesn't really matter as long as you have the entry into force provisions and um, you can call it as, uh, as an outcome that uh, can go under the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. Um, we also want to um, focus on the obligations within the, the outcome and also the compliance provisions. So, you can have a protocol, but what within it is is what matters. But we were pushing for a protocol because it has a it has a nice sense of feel to it when you go home and say we we actually achieved it. But it doesn't really agreement protocol doesn't have a, a huge difference. So we, we are okay with whatever we call it. Well, I once uh, before the Paris. Um, uh, COP, we were in a panel, I think Christina was also there, somebody said, you can even call it a sunflower, it doesn't matter. <laughs> as long as you have those provisions, the entry to force provisions, the obligations within it, and then the compliance provisions. So we do have those in. But again, as I mentioned before, the devil is in the detail, the, the obligations within the agreement, some are very vague, particularly around climate finance, as well as mitigation. You saw the difference between word shall and should and how that discussion went on. But overall, um, we have something very close to a protocol. Do you want to say something? Yeah, just, I mean, a, a slightly a, a alternative. Uh, we, uh, likewise, Brazil was uh, pushing for uh, more legal stringency as possible, uh, but we were not attached. To, to to the name uh, protocol and, and I, I think agreement in the end uh, covers all possibilities. Uh, what we'd like to draw attention to is when you look at the, uh, the objective of the agreement, it, it talks a lot about implementation. So one, uh, another way of seeing it, uh, rather than a protocol in everything but the name, which it's also true, but it's also uh, an implementation agreement, a little bit like uh, an analogy could be drawn with the implementation agreement of Part 11 of the Law of the Sea Convention, which is the agreement that actually allowed, uh, that gave the political and legal conditions for our parties to, to really implement what something that had, a, had actually already been agreed upon. And not only under the convention, but uh, one thing that the Paris Agreement is also different from a lot of uh, other agreements is that it, it it's not something that 
uh, it's not a legal agreement that goes and on and to build institutions. It actually, uh, it, it actually builds upon a lot of legal and uh, political institutions that had been there since uh, at least since Copenhagen. So it's, uh, I like seeing it from that perspective as, a, as a, an implementation agreement. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, the, the, the issue that Philippe just touched upon is actually one of the mm. issues that link back to your initial question about the one of the m most difficult issues in the negotiations until the very end was the, the link and the reference to the convention and is it an implementation agreement, is it something where we can directly refer to articles of the convention, is it something which is in the context of implementing the convention, have a very diverse views and, and very controversial. And that is probably one of the reasons why we don't see a protocol, because that would link back to Article 17 of the convention, which talks about implementation. Um, the, the issue of the link to the convention was resolved primarily by the, the Durban uh, uh, mandate, which said it's under the convention, but also then in Article 2 of the agreement which talks of, it's about enhancing the implementation of the conventions, not just about implementing the convention, but enhancing the implementation of the convention, which is a different different issue. And that's probably one of the reasons for, for legal uh, uh, argumentation that it's not <laughs> protocol in the sense of Article 17, because that would have gone back this, this whole context into the implementation of the convention. Um, but it's, it's, it's a treaty in, in the context of the Vienna Convention on the Law, law of Treaties and, and all the, the provisions of the Vienna Convention apply and that, that is, for lawyers, perhaps the most important things. Once it enters into force, whenever that is going to happen, uh, we, we, not don't, this we don't, not, not this, yeah. this week. <laughs> I, should ask, I should ask you all to do a screen stay on and check the time see who gets the post on. Yeah, if, if I can just jump over to Annalisa's question on, on human rights, yes. unless Mathieu wants to... No, no Mathieu, was, I fully share your views, I mean, uh, all your views. <laughs> <laughs> very friendly. Um, no, the thing is, Morocco, from the very beginning, said it would uh, want a legally binding instrument, so that's what we, we've got. As I said before, I mean, there were concerns as to what legal force uh, uh, would be recognized for the empty seats and the way it could be anchored, housed, moored, or attached, or somewhere put um, around or under the agreement. Um, and, and I think, well, uh, with what we have in the end, so the NDC is um, uh, inscribed into a registry maintained by the, uh, by, by the Secretariat, is, is one interesting option. However, <coughs> I think Morocco was a bit disappointed with the way Article um, 14 is, is uh, spelled out, and particularly with respect to uh, the obligation of, uh, of countries to prepare, communicate, and maintain uh, national demand contribution, because then, okay, they are on the safe side in terms of not being pushed, uh, legally speaking, if they do not achieve what they have promised to do, but still they thought um, it could be, however, good to have the imp the word implement in that uh, particular uh, provision to make sure that at least domestically it would be legally binding and enforceable. Um, do you want to say something about the environmental justice problems? No. no. Sorry, I picked yeah. up wrong. No, 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 but it, you wanted to say something about the human rights. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's what it was. <laughs> my chair just got me thinking about something. Else. That's, that's the, the, the compliance <laughs> article um, 15, I think. Because what we, we now have is a, is a mechanism to um, promote compliance. It's something familiar to us lawyers, but also to facilitate implementation. And that's something we still have to get our heads around, what that actually entails. And that's still open. We spent a lot of negotiation time, but never made it into an agreement. But there is something there that could capture the implementation of the numbers of the target, yep. uh, but not as compliance, but as facilitating implementation. But back to, to human rights, and, and I'm very... Uh, but I'm grateful <laughs> for your question, Annalisa. Um, you said, is, is the reference to human rights a game changer? I mean, where it's now, it's in the preamble, and it talks human rights in the context of 
uh, implementing or no, the, the respective obligation, the respective human rights obligations of the parties. And that was very, very important. I think that was the crucial addition to saving the place for human rights in the agreement to make sure that there is nothing new to it. It's the human rights obligations that parties already have from treaties or from uh, customary law, but it's nothing new that the the the, uh, the agreement establishes. And and I think that was the one and only way to get consensus on a reference to human rights in the preamble that that's where it's and just because in the construct live university, I'll try to be brief. Uh, first question is for Philippe, uh, second is for Mathieu. So I'll be very clear. <laughs> <laughs> At the law school, both staff and students, we work a lot on sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. Now, here we are talking about climate change. Very important, obviously. Same year, climate change was one of the 17 top goals of the SDGs. I have a very, I'm very curious you know whether both in the two weeks in Paris and throughout the year, our delegation, like the Brazilian, in particular Brazil because of its diversity, and because it touches all the 17 goals of the SDGs, to what extent is the implementation of the SDGs present in the corridors in Paris when you are negotiating the Paris, what did you call it? Sunflower. <laughs> <laughs> and, to, and to Mathieu, we had this question yesterday with our with Achal. I ask you, I ask you. So Paris, 150 heads of state, media frenzy, everybody talking about it. When will it ever happen again? So crystal ball and why? <laughs>
and, and that's a foothold for the real interlinkage that if countries will, and not only with one goal, but to see the Paris Agreement as a sustainable development issue rather than just an environmental issue or just a climate change issue. It, it, it's much broader than that, and that's also something that we are particularly happy about the Paris Agreement is that uh, there is only one reference to sustainable development in the Convention. There are much more references to, to sustainable development in the agreement, and specifically in the context of how you should pursue your your mitigation goals. It has to be in the, in the context of sustainable development. So it's it's a much broader agenda. So I think that interlinkage that you're looking for is going it's going to happen throughout implementation of both agendas, but not just one goal, actually all of them. If, if I can say one word about SDGs, yes. uh, just because I like Brazil, I'm in Morocco is one of SDGs. <laughs> and, and exactly as he said, um, I think Morocco um, believe that it should um, be used as a sort of meta norms. I know the controversy about this concept, but to guide at least the implementation of the Paris Agreement, at least to defragmentate the climate regime. I refer here to the excellent uh, book uh, written by Haru, who is uh, here present, so I can speak under his control, but thanks, Haru, for that uh, literature. Uh, but the Simorco is really a fan of it, and uh, it not just to drive the implementation of mitigation commitments, but uh, even more, uh, adaptation, course, actually. Uh, but that's more from, um, let's say, um, least developed countries as compared to Brazil. Uh, <laughs> uh, coming back to the crystal ball, um, I think, I think Marrakesh could be de very different uh, and, and cannot really be compared to, to Paris. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think we won't have the same way of managing the process as the French did it, and as uh, I mean, Christina very uh, well described at the beginning of her, of her presentation, um, I think we enter in a, in a more operational phase. We have to uh, materialize the, the intentions of, of parties that, is, uh, that are being reflected um, in the terms of compromise in, in the agreement. Uh, I think the most difficult thing now is to define the priorities. Uh, which issues should be handled first and how. I mean, transparency, um, I mentioned earlier on uh, innovation, but that's for the overall, it's the chapeau of the perhaps of uh, Marrakesh. But in terms of implementation of the Paris Agreement, it's clear that transparency is, is very, very important. And also the follow-up of all the provisions of the decision on, on um, a future review and and then in the end submission of NDCs together with the uh, ratification or approval of the There is a particular attention paid to to those uh, two issues, which are very much uh, interlinked together. As a developing country, um, and because it wants to build alliances and and create bridges with with a number of uh, of developing countries across geographic groups. I guess a lot of attention will be put also on capacity building. We have this initiative that has been established with this um, component on transparency. So that should uh, uh, draw a, a lot of attention from, from on the American side, I guess. So crystal ball uh, is still <coughs> not very clear. <laughs> but I, I hope once we know exactly how the government uh, is, is prepared to take on the future presidency hands in hands with the French. And we should know uh, hopefully by the end of this month. Um, then we'll know the priorities and, and I guess it will, uh, it will be a, a work in progress towards uh, the crystal ball. So uh, I suggest we, we look at the crystal ball in June. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Very good. Um, maybe the lady in the hat towards the back. Uh, my name is Martin Ann, and you wish to scratch my um, I'm wondering if there was any broad concern about the fact that aviation and maritime are not included in the Paris Agreement. 
and nor are the methane emissions that are coming from um, the plunger that is both frozen and unfrozen. Because uh, together they probably contribute a significant amount to um, climate change. We'd like to volunteer. No, very quickly. Personally, I feel very, very frustrated. <laughs> but that's a personal opinion. <laughs> because as you rightly point out, this will represent uh, a large portion of GHG emissions. I mean, the projection says around 20% to 2030, so it's, it's, it's going to be a lot. Uh, it was just a funny um, uh, story from the Moroccan side. Uh, when, I, when I told the minister, because I was uh, the sheriff of the minister, Aviation, well, bunkers are not in, and she said, we, we have to fight and to have them in. And <laughs> two minutes later, the transport minister <laughs> he said, no, no, forget about it. <laughs> um, anyone like to add? Um, that's, that's a matter that the, the international aviation and, and sea transport emissions are uh, what we called bunkers in negotiators language. Uh, it's uh, that's bunkers with a U, and that's not bunkers with a U. Uh, <laughs> uh, so a bunker fuse, we there is already action going on in the uh, uh, IMO and the ICAO. And that action actually started back in the, the Kyoto Protocol. So there was several iterations of the text where there was reference to, to bunker fuels uh, and eventually was dropped at some point between the first and the second week. Funny thing is actually <coughs> no one complained about it. The countries that were most uh, uh, pushing for that agenda, I, I, I don't recall anyone raising their flags and saying that has to come back. Uh, and I, I think that's an acknowledgement that uh, there is already action going on in those other um, uh, in, or international organizations. Uh, and eventually, the reference will be very similar. Well, the reference will be asking those organizations to deal with the issue. And, and the, the political problem in that is how? Because there is a, uh, there is a matter of uh, competence of where where does the UNFCCC conference ends when it comes to climate change and where it starts with the I, uh, IMO and, and, and the KAO. And there's also um, uh, uh, unresolved dispute between how you're going to do it because uh, UNFCCC is all about differentiation. It's all about common but differentiated responsibilities. And when you have these discussions on climate change in, in London and Montreal, uh, then the, those international negotiators that are particularly protective of their terms, <laughs> they, will, they will evoke the principles of their own uh, organizations, which include uh, no differentiation whatsoever, no, uh, no discriminatory uh, treatment. So it's, uh, it's an... Uh, it's an, uh, so I think by not having a reference, it allows a discussion to continue where it's going on with considerable progress uh, to this point under the current mandate. Uh, but it doesn't really preclude discussing this issue uh, in the future at the Paris. I think that's that's probably that's probably something that will eventually come up through the nationally determined contribution. I hope nothing. I hope nothing. Mr. Um, my name is Elizabeth Beck. I'm from the Chief School. And I've also in fact been around the organization for the And and I guess my immediate reaction is probably different than some people. Um, I was frankly left a bit disappointed, not from the agreement itself, but from the feeling of the crowd. Um, I'm maybe the only person in this room with not with elite backgrounds, um, so that's where my perspective is going to be crushed. Thank you. Then you be able to. Um, but I felt like there was a, I was disappointed with the rift between um, the, the, the people that were there and frankly the negotiators and the teams. 
um, and from my perspective, uh, multilateralism, multilateralism in the history of this process is something that's come from, from war, really. And I just wonder whether this version of multilateralism that we're still continuing to do with the UN is still relevant when it comes to something like climate change that extends beyond uh, country, national boundaries, um, and is much more relevant to, to people, to businesses, to society, to local governments, and whether um, whether this type of multilateralism is enough. And if not, um, how, how do we better engage civil society and businesses with this type of agreement and this type of process? Um, and what responsibility do uh, whether it's the UN or countries or parties have in engaging people in this process better? Sorry, that was maybe three questions. <laughs> No, uh, <clears throat> there's some very good themes in all of that. Multilateralism um, involving businesses, involving people, societies, countries. Um, who would like to go first? Can I just say that the uh, <coughs> Scottish civil society presence at, at, at Paris was, was very impressive. The, the 2050 uh, Young Climate Leaders event was, was inspiring. And uh, Scotland, the Eco Congregation Scotland, with their climate justice baton, that you know, all around Scotland and into Paris. So, I mean, it was a great example of the wider links that have to be made in order to deliver the climate change agenda. And it's always been part of the Scottish doctrine that it's not governments uh, alone that's going to deliver this. It's it's cities, businesses, civic society uh, that, that's, that's going to drive this agenda. Once they get the, the big signal from Paris, which hopefully. You know, was delivered. Um, on your question on multilateralism and whether we see any added value, if I understood your question correctly, I think we've already heard a bit of uh, um, uh, uh, reflections on on the added value of the agreement provided by by her and and, and Francesco on first of all the comparability of efforts with the transparency system hopefully at some stage, but also on the, the as you said, how the, the enabler to work together to help each other, that, that kind of, also the complexity of issues that need to be captured under one umbrella. But I think one thing that we haven't really heard that much about are the the, the iterative processes that this, this agreement has, or is about to set in motion. I think this is my personal opinion is that is one of the, the most important added value it are these processes that we do have um, collective stock take every five years. The outcome of the collective stock take is supposed to inform the next round of NDCs of nationally determined contributions. But it's the, also the connection of these processes that spiral up, as, as, as Achala said, combined with a number of principles that have not yet been discussed in, in any detail. Uh, Har already uh, alluded to the principle of progression that every single uh, new contribution, successive national determined contribution is supposed to go beyond previous ones. Um, that national determined contributions are supposed to be ambitious from the outset but also increase in their, uh, in their level of ambition, presenting or reflecting the, the highest uh, possible ambition which means that everybody is supposed to do as good as they can. I think that kind of dynamism, flexibility, being built in into the, the, the backbone of this agreement makes it something very different from anything we've, we've so far had, at least in the climate regime, but also in general in, 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 in international environmental law. And it's definitely uh, an, an added value because it keeps it keeps the, the possibility to reflect or to be reflexive of of outcomes of learning processes for every single party, but also keeps the the the, um, the, the, the sovereign scope, the sovereign space that is very very important. You, that's a very uh, uh, strong uh, um, uh, uh, protective uh, uh, in, an idea about what, what you know what you're going to be been told on an international level in terms of legally binding um, parameters. But I think if you you have to see it. In total, it's in you, you cannot put out a pinch to one particular issue, but the, the total architecture is something um, that makes definitely the whole being more than the sum of the parts. Mm. <laughs> 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 
Um, I, I understand the frustration. There were many meetings um, that were closed, informal meetings that were closed for observer organizations. So um, observer uh, organizations were there and they didn't know what's going on. So that frustration I understand, but I must, I must say that um, there are um, a lot of things going on to, uh, to, to have that inclusive approach to ensure that people, civil society is, 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 is included in this process. One is the Lima Paris action again. I don't have the numbers now, but if you look at how, how many business organizations, how many banks, how many cities committed to, to work on climate change now because of this process that we were in, which is the multilateral process, it's, it's pretty amazing. And the second thing is there was a whole lengthy discussion going on uh, around um, action by non-state actors uh, within the negotiations uh, in terms of pre-2020 action as well as the Paris Agreement and, and it is reflected in the outcomes. And the third thing is the, the INDC process now, the National Climate Action Plan preparation process which is a very much bottom-up process countries decide what they want to do and how they are going to do it. And the civil society has a huge role in it to, to, to ensure that there, there are some top-down elements, particularly around transparency and compliance, but this is a very much bottom-up process. And, and countries at the very first INDs, this very first National Climate Action Plans, if you look at them, they are very much, as, as, um, as Haro said, raised to the bottom. And there are reasons for it, mainly because the fear of unknown. We, many of our countries didn't know what the Paris Agreement was going to look like, so countries didn't actually uh, put forward the maximum they can, uh, many, many of us. Uh, and, and there, for that, within that cycle of commitments, every five years countries coming together to look back in terms of implementation and look forward in terms of what they are going to do next. Uh, with uh, uh, the principle of progression, there is a huge role for the civil society to play. The, the consultative process that the countries will have to go through in terms of preparing their IMBC. So it's not the civil society, but business communities, the universities, um, all of us have a huge role to play. Yeah, but very briefly, I think just one is exactly because uh, Climate change is a problem that goes beyond governments. It's why we need multilateralism, because the alternative in an international system based on national sovereign states is when a group of countries try to impose a solution to other group of countries, and that historically didn't go very well. Uh, in, in the case of the Paris Agreement, uh, not only there's this added value of the, the comparability, but this is also key for the climate change issue as such because of the nature of the problem. The, the, it, it has <coughs> a collective action slash global commons uh, characteristics. So no one wants to take action by themselves. They have to be reassured that their peers are taking the same level uh, of action. So even in that, even an aggregate uh, effort allows you to see how well you're doing in relation to the to, to the global uh, response <coughs> um, it's uh, I don't see this I don't see necessarily as a bad thing the bottom-up approach for civil society quite the opposite <coughs> at least take at least considering the the Brazilian experience uh, our uh, dialogues with civil society we what we have experienced so far is coalition of NGOs, coalitions of NGOs lobbying and making uh, political pressure for the national government to accept targets. And suddenly, now there is a regular interface on the international level, but that is re reflected also in the national level. And every five years, countries will have to go through some sort of national process uh, in order to develop their new iterations of NDCs. And that allows uh, a new, that creates a new place, a new locus for uh, the climate debate that is much more 
tailored ma made to, to, to national government. So I think uh, more and more civil society will find, and, and, and civil society and business uh, will find uh, places to discuss climate change on the national level, try to push forward uh, climate policies. And then I, we have an ongoing discussion on this. And then it's not about only about your highest possible ambition. And that, uh, it's, it's not, Article 4.3 of, uh, of the agreement doesn't talk about only about your highest possible ambition. It talks also that your effort, even though it's self-determined, it has to reflect your responsibility, your capability, and circumstance. So that's where I think NGOs have uh, a new place to, to, to work in climate change, is to make their national governments, uh, to make sure that their national governments are, in, in the design of their policies, are uh, reflecting their responsibility, their capability, their circumstances in order to reach the highest possible ambition. Okay. Brief, brief comments. Sure. I just would like to fully uh, support what has been said by our friend from Brazil. I think it's it's exactly the same uh, for a country like Morocco. But <coughs> if I can understand your frustration, you may also understand that for a country, a small developing country where civil society is not yet really educated and not mobilized like in Morocco, I mean uh, the multilateralism remains the legitimate place where to discuss this. However, it was a, there was a real shift that I could feel in the delegation of Morocco in Paris when they really understand the added value, I would even say the beauty of the Lima Paris Action Agenda uh, as a way to really mobilize stakeholders, all stakeholders, in particular civil society. And there, the Moroccans really understood they need now to mobilize their civil society in Morocco together with the civil society from <coughs> other countries in the run-up to uh, COP22 to make it a success and to continue this Lima, Paris, Marrakesh, what's the next, um, action agenda. <laughs> and, and really, <laughs> that, that to, to avoid that this is just a one-stop uh, exercise because this is a really important exercise to mobilize people and engage in really concrete actions beyond the blah blah of, of governmental people. I think that's a very good um, time maybe just to draw that to a close. Just before I hand over to Michael, we're <coughs> going to do um, a, a quick summing up. Just to say thank you very much again to the panel. Um, very interesting insight. So if you'd like to pass on your thanks.